uh, talk about your um, what you're learning, what what you thought you learned, uh, what worked for you in the course, and that type of thing, right? So I want to um, hear that, right? So and what we've talked about in this course is that it's a little bit self-determined. It's not quite a independent study course, but it has given you a chance to choose what you want to emphasize in this course and drill down into it with your research reviews and your projects. So as you talk about that, I want to I want to hear about that in your self-assessment. So um, the project, as you're turning that in, you're going to uh, you know, do a little bit of that also is talk to me, you know, in, in written form in, in your report, uh, talk to me about what you learned uh, in that experience during that project. Okay. All right. Now we'll go back and share again and we will talk about Ross uh, robot operating system. No, nope, not that presentation. This one. Okay, so <laughs> the uh, different manufacturers are going to use uh, different applications. Again, there, you know, we have this in mind of the, the um, level five uh, passenger vehicle type of autonomy, right? But there's lots of other autonomous vehicles out there at, at different levels of autonomy. And so a, a lot of those are going to be using the robot operating system in one way or another. Now, it is not necessarily a uh, autonomy package. It uh, can be done just simply as a remote control type package, right, or a pre-programmed type of thing um, that doesn't necessarily have a ton of autonomy associated with it, right? But it's a very, very common system. It's uh, very powerful, but also able to be scaled down to very small platforms. So uh, these are links you can go and get a little bit more information about ROS and its different flavors, but it's a set of software libraries and tools for building robot applications, right? Robot operating system. Uh, ROS M is actually a hardened fork of ROS 2. So when we talk about ROS these days, I'm, I, I misspoke there, ROS 1. When we talk about ROS these days, it's really this ROS 2 is a, the current version. Uh, but that was preceded by ROS 1. There's different versions within these um, ROS 1 and, and ROS 2, but there was a big change in going to ROS 2. The DOD had already a lot invested in ROS, and uh, part of that was hardening it, right? So when uh, whether it's the, the military or Homeland Security or, um, you know, FAA or, or whatever, when they use software, they, they kind of go the extra mile, or at least they're supposed to, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, there's not vulnerabilities in these softwares, right? So there's not uh, just bad bugs like buffer overrun, uh, bugs, but there's also not, or, or memory leaks and, and that type of thing, but there's also um, really the, the big focus is on cybersecurity, right? So that there's not um, uh, vulnerabilities that can allow an adversary to get into a system and, and compromise it. So uh, when we talk about hardening, it's gone through a uh, kind of a review process, an assessment process, and now there's uh, kind of a, a custody associated with that so that uh, you know that when you're working with Ross M or military or whatever, the, the Ross M's version of it, that you're getting uh, what, what you think you are. So I'll uh, click through on these here real quick. And... Um, uh, so here's, 
here's the Ross M. And um, so this is this is one of the Army's leader follower type of uh, truck vehicles, I think. So it's uh, autonomous in terms of like the leader would be a manned vehicle and then all the other and the convoy would be following it. And uh, then this is a pack uh, robot uh, to be used in situations that are hazardous for uh, a person to go in, like dealing with this artillery shell. I've used um, Ross M a little bit in uh, the work I did with the Army's robotic combat vehicle. And that was, uh, that's a technically a remote controlled vehicle, but it does have some level autonomy, just like a, um, a consumer drone does if it gets too far away and it loses the connection to the controller, then it will fly back to its safe uh, GPS location, right? So uh, the RCV has some of those uh, kind of minimal autonomy type features in it uh, to accomplish that. So, uh, you know, general public doesn't really get uh, direct access to this. You kind of have to show your U.S. citizen, blah, 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 promise you won't divulge it, all that fun stuff. So uh, this is the Ross, uh, Ross 2, uh, kind of the, the documentation and all, so you can get a link to that. And I think we're done with that. And then, um, yeah, so uh, Ross 1 you can follow also. But uh, if you're starting a new project, you definitely want to be dealing with Ross 2. Uh, unless you're working on a, a defense-related application. Oh, and it's free and open source. Yay, we like that, right? So most of us do at least. So, uh, All right, what is the ROS architecture? It's a directed graph. We've heard of that before, right? So we've used this uh, concept in routing before when we were uh, dealing with that. And... Um, uh, but now we have these nodes that are sitting at the vertices of this directed graph and topics uh, that represent edges, right? So this is how nodes communicate with each other. So a node could be a uh, oil pressure sensor uh, on a vehicle, or um, it could be a, um, a force feedback sensor on a gripper that is telling the controller how uh, how strong of a grip that it's in in uh, imposing on whatever it's trying to pick up or it can be all the type of sensors we talked about before right so the rotary encoders the cameras and and all that lidars whatnot um and nodes, uh, and it can also be actuators, and it can also be just uh, computing things, right? So um, nodes can publish or, or talk on topics and subscribe or listen to topics. Right? Topics are composed of defined messages. Nodes are configured by parameters, which are key value pairs, and there's uh, like a descriptor associated with also. Uh, we have uh, services, and uh, which are essentially remote procedure calls. Uh, they're synchronous. In other words, you know, I'm going to uh, expect an answer back right away, and uh, uh, there's a guarantee associated with it, right? So um, that I know that if I'm, I'm calling a, a service, just like if you call a subroutine, Right? You, it's either going to work or it's not. And, and it, it's, it's not, you've got a bug type of thing, right? So, um, actions are more asynchronous. It's These would be used for long running type of processes. And we'll, we're going to dive into detail on all of these here. Um, here's a architecture uh, overview I uh, grabbed from a, a website from a, a Company that does a lot of these things, and I should have given them some credit. Maybe I'll, I'll try to catch up with that when I post this again. Um, so up here you have your user code, 
right? The code that you you write. And then underneath this is all this kind of libraries and middleware and OSs and that type of thing, right? So you're, when you write a robot application, uh, a lot of it's already done for you, right? So all the the lower part of the stack has is, is been done. And probably a lot of the, the sensors and actuators and a lot of even the algorithms are, are done. And you're just building a new robot. Well, you might have a little bit of code to do, right? That's the advantage of using a, a kind of open systems architecture like this. Uh, this client layer, uh, you might need to go into this if you're doing some, you know, special stuff and implementing uh, new uh, type things. Uh, there's a the, these are wrappers of this kind of C uh, implementation, this library. This is this is where most of the real raw stuff is happening. But then there's this um, uh, DDS that's that data distribution service. So this is when we talked about having nodes that are connected via topics, that topics is describing data moving, right? And so the DDS layer is is handling that. And that can be a, um, so there's an abstraction layer and then there's different implementations, right? So if you uh, are happy with the default implementation, that's great. If you think that some proprietary uh, solution is going to give you a little bit better performance. That's great too, right? So, uh, and then underneath that, finally, is going to be your um, uh, your OS support. So, uh, except I did not find support for my brand new Mac M3 processor. Oh well. Uh, so I'm going to show you on my Linux box uh, in a little bit. All right. Um, so let's look at these in detail, uh, ROS nodes. Nodes are the unit of computation in a ROS graph, right? So uh, that should do one logical thing and do it well, right? So we're going to do some calculations. We might be uh, uh, reading a hardware sensor and maybe uh, scaling and calibrating those units and uh, or, or measurements, and then uh, we we post them out on a topic, or we might be uh, accepting, you know, listening on a topic for a command and then uh, affecting some actuator to, to do something, right? Uh, or we might just be performing calculations, right? We might have a, a ROS node that is doing navigation uh, or routing or, or uh, something like that, perception. Uh, nodes can publish and or subscribe to named topics. Right? They can act as a service client, a service server, an action client, and or an action server. They can uh, do uh, a combinations of these things. Uh, again, kind of staying with this philosophy of doing one logical thing, but might have different interfaces uh, uh, to that one logical thing. And they typically have configurable parameters. Nodes, when they uh, start up and join a network, they're going to advertise themselves to other nodes on the network in the same ROS domain. So what is a ROS domain? Well, you pick a number, and uh, that um, it's kind of related to like a network port type of thing, but it's going to be um, uh, unique for a particular uh, robot application, ROS application, right? So you could have multiple domains on the same network, but they will not uh, directly talk to each other. If you're putting a message, publishing a message on a topic, right? Well, we talked about how that's a broadcast, at, or and that's that was um, um, we talked about that in Pan type of things, but it's it's going to happen here also, right? It's going to go uh, everywhere. And, uh, but the other uh, domains aren't going to be able to see those messages, right? So, uh, but nodes are going to advertise them when they start up and then periodically, 
and then when they go offline, right? So they'll they'll say, I'm going offline now, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this periodically helps because, um, you know, another node joins the network, it, it needs to kind of still eventually hear who else is on that network to be able to figure out who to talk to, uh, who to collaborate with. And also, uh, so not just when you start, but also periodically. And then nodes also respond to advertisements with their own info. Right? So, uh, so everyone gets to learn about everyone. Uh, nodes connect and communicate automatically. And you can also enforce this quality of uh, service, right? So you can say that, um, you know, I need your availability and performance and that type of thing to meet a certain, certain level. Uh, then we have this concept of interfaces. These nodes communicate through interfaces. These are uh, described using interface definition language. So the uh, this concept is uh, pretty pretty broad in uh, computing systems. Uh, when you start composing systems at different uh, objects, components, that type of thing, right? So we've we've had. Uh, some form of an interface definition language for for um, many decades and uh, or at least a couple of uh, uh, couple of decades plus uh, at least I can think of uh, one of the nice things about this is it supports automatic code generation in target languages right so you can write this interface definition language once and it's going to basically say all right here's here's how this node, communicates and this field means that and, and that type of thing, right? And then uh, you can um, run a tool that will generate Python code to basically implement that interface. Now, if you got an algorithm associated with that, you still got to write that, but it will uh, provide that whole skeleton for all of that, right? And, uh, or you might want it done in C++ or C Sharp or, or Java or something like that, right? Uh, so you write once and you can maintain it once and then uh, be able to uh, publish that out in various target languages. This is nice because you might be developing a ROS compatible node uh, that does something and you want to sell that or, or provide it to others uh, and you want uh, people to be able to use it regardless of what kind of language that they're developing it. Right? So uh, this this IDE, IDL will define uh, the topics that the message interacts with, either publishes or, or subscribes to, and that will be defined in uh, a .msg file with a series of descriptive fields. And then there's uh, services and actions uh, defined in their respective uh, files. Uh, services have a request and a response. Uh, actions, well, because they're not really guaranteed, we're going to specify instead of saying a request, we're going to talk about that in terms of a goal, right? and uh, hope that that goal is achieved and we'll get some sort of result and importantly in actions we'll get some feedback right but these all uh the reason why we're uh, uh specifying them here is that they need to be identified in this idl right? so that every other node can know how to interact with that node uh this this target node here that's being specified by this IDL and uh, be able to interpret uh, how to uh, act upon these services and actions and and or how to request them and how to interpret the results and same thing with the topics. Uh, there's ROS uh, interfaces and this IDL comes with a set of built-in types. These types can be expanded to arrays and uh, you can also have kind of more complex things by composing these different types. And we've got names, um, uh, so we can name things. Uh, the uh, We can declare a, a default value uh, for any of these uh, 
uh, variables or, or fields here, and we can also uh, declare constants. So these all have the obvious meanings. All right, so uh, topics. So here again, uh, I think we've seen this a few times. We have this uh, publish and subscribe type of uh, interface. If you've uh, worked in, uh, typically you see MQTT, um, uh, uh, it, particularly implementation of that is, is Rabbit. Rabbit MQTT is a um, lightweight performant uh, queue or bus uh, that uh, has this pub sub uh, semantics, and you'll typically see that in embedded systems. Uh, at the maybe other extreme, you have things like Kafka that are used in big data type applications and maybe on a cloud infrastructure. And uh, they're, um, you know, might be consuming from a, a, a NiFi port and um, uh, or, or front end and, and storing in some NoSQL database or, or uh, something like that, right? So basically just scaled for, for big, big data, everything in between. These are all pub sub type of queues, right? And so the idea is that a publisher can post to a topic in a broadcast fashion. And uh, I'm just, you know, uh, let's say I'm a center and uh, I'm generating data. So I'm gonna post uh, this data to a named topic onto this queue or this bus. And um, uh, you can have zero to N of those, right? And uh, then you can, although zero doesn't, you know, it's not, doesn't make sense on a practical basis, but things don't break if there are no publishers at any given time. You can have subscribers or listeners and they'll just sit there and listen to silence if there's no publishers, right? So it's a very loosely coupled uh, system. If uh, you have a, uh, a, a sensor sender as a publisher go down, uh, it doesn't like bring down the whole system. You just stop getting that data. Uh, you can also have zero to end subscribers, right? Sometimes I'm sitting here lecturing and, um, you know, so I've got one publisher I'm lecturing. Uh, but I have no idea if any of y'all are actually listening, right? So I might have zero, zero listeners or uh, maybe 18 listeners, right? Or subscribers. So, um, all right. The, the other uh, key here is it's anonymous. Uh, it doesn't mean it's purely anonymous, uh, but what what it does mean is that it, it doesn't really matter which node publishes publishes. Uh, a datum or any piece of data, right? Uh, if if uh, we're getting uh, temperature data and uh, maybe we have for redundancy sake, we've got a couple of temperature uh, sensors out there, I uh, it doesn't matter. I don't have to connect to a specific one that those publishers are publishing data and I just need to uh, read from that topic and, and get that data. So this is cool because this we can swap things in and out on the fly. Uh, so if we're needing to maintain a system and our oil pressure sender unit uh, no longer is working, well, we yank it out and put a new one in. And conceivably, maybe you wouldn't want to do this with oil pressure, but um, you could conceivably do this while the system is is running and um, assuming that the electronics handle it without um, uh, current surges and voltage spikes and, and whatnot. But, um, but from a data flow standpoint, a logical standpoint, you should be able to, to do that. So um, uh, they're not tied to each other. They're uh, very loosely coupled. But these things are strongly typed. We need to be able to uh, unambiguously interpret the data that's uh, flowing on this. So we need to know whether it's a, a short or long or float or double or, or whatnot. Now we also have uh, services. We've talked about services and actions. And so we'll go into them a little bit deeper here. 
services uh, can be uh, either a server or a client, right? So the idea of a service is that it's a, um, a synchronous remote procedure call. The client makes the call and the server uh, responds to it, does something, and then returns a response. Uh, that response could just be, um, uh, you know, a, a return, uh, but that it's uh, it's it's sending back. Uh, typically, it's going to send back some confirmation or a result, right? So you might uh, issue a uh, RPC call to um, to uh, move move forward or whatever, right? So and you're going to return back and say, yes, I, I did that. Um, the uh, this remote procedure call means that we can do this across process boundaries, right? So we can have one program uh, doing one thing and another program doing another thing, and then they communicate. So these are not all one big monolithic program. These are composed of lots of different things, and then we're uh, doing these remote procedure calls. Uh, and they, uh, you know, are often typically not on the same computer. Right? So, um, but the uh, client makes that synchronous call. So it's going to block while the server is doing its actions, right? So think of it as, as on a local basis, when you write a program, most of the time you, uh, until you get to some more advanced advanced programming, when you call a subroutine, you're waiting until that subroutine does its business and returns, right? And uh, so it doesn't return until it's done all that you ask it to do, right? If it's doing a for loop of zero to 10,000 epochs of training, well, you're going to have to wait for all that time before it comes back, right? So, um, so typically we want to make sure that these uh, we, we use services when the server can do its job and return quickly because the client is blocked and it can't do anything. It's just sitting there waiting until this returns back. So if you don't have that, if it's going to take the server a long time to do something, let's say it's solving a traveling salesman problem uh, of, of routing and it's going to take minutes or, or at least seconds to uh, to do that. So then we might want to implement that as an action. So services are identified by service name. Only, uh, should be really only one server, but potentially many clients for service name, right? So you have a service, a service can be implemented as a server or a client, right? It's more of a concept, but there should be one server so that uh, it gets uh, any any client that calls that service, uh, it's gonna go to that same, same uh, server. Then actions are uh, now what you would do with long-term, long-running uh, functions, right? So if that server is gonna take a long time to do what it's asked of it, then we should call it asynchronously. Now, when you call it, the client calls it again, right? And it's going to return very quickly, but uh, just with uh, like a handle and a confirmation that at least we got called and we're starting, right? And then the server starts its work and then can provide feedback on the status of how it's doing, right? Maybe I'm 10% uh, done or 20% or done or 30% done. Uh, the client can uh, then consume that feedback. It can subscribe to it and, and consume it and um, maybe uh, render that on some screen or, or something like that, right? Uh, and then it can also be cancelable. So if you uh, 
uh, waiting and uh, you change your mind or something like that. This is a long running process. So if, if you've changed your mind, you don't need any more conditions changed, it's not relevant, uh, you can go ahead and cancel it. So we talked about how nodes are configured by parameters. These are declared a priori by default. There's ways around that, but in general, you're wanting to declare these parameters a priori, but they're set at startup and are changeable during runtime. In other words, they're, they're set outside of your compiled code, right? Or, or written code if it's, if it's Python. And so it, it can be read in and um, uh, configured at startup. So you can change those parameters, maybe using a text editor or something like that and restart it and run and it will adopt those new parameters. And they're changeable during runtime also, right? And uh, so maybe this is the sample rate of some sensor. How often do you want it to, to sample? Or uh, do you want it to filter the data? And maybe you change the cutoff frequencies of that filter or, or something, or, or scaling that uh, data in, in some way. So uh, different, different type of parameters. Um, they are configured on a node by node basis. So you might have uh, two nodes that are both um, um, you know, position sensors or, or rotary encoders, let's say. But maybe one node is attached to the left wheel, left front wheel or left track, and the other one's on the right hand side. And uh, so you might uh, have different parameters uh, for those. So you can uh, adjust those on a node by node basis. They're generally a key and a value, right? So uh, key means it's gonna have kind of a name associated with it. Typically, uh, these would be like a human readable name and then the value uh, so uh, would be attached to that. Um, and then uh, you can also have this descriptor, right? So these are really what's gonna be used to, to set this so that the node is gonna read its configuration file. It's going to um, identify what that parameter uh, means through the key and Again, this is why it needs to be uh, kind of de declared a priori. It needs to know what that key means. And then uh, like what value does, if it's sample rate, then it's going to uh, be assigned to some uh, timer uh, value in the code, right? So that it can uh, 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 you know, trigger this uh, timer at this periodic rate. And the value then obviously would be the value uh, that's associated with that. But then you can also have a, a, a descriptor associated with that, and uh, just more of a human readable type of thing. Um, so parameters also have these uh, three different callbacks associated with them to allow the node to respond to changes, right? So we can have these things set at startup, but they can also be changeable during runtime. Well, if you're changing the, uh, let's say, sample rate of a sensor, that node needs to know how to respond to it, right? And, and be able to, to do that. So there's uh, three different callbacks that you can register in your code, and in your node code, and then that node will will respond to this. So the framework will will uh, call the function associated with this callback on your node when um, these parameters are being changed, right? So this add pre pre set parameter callbacks, right? So let's let's peel this part. Callback is something that the um, a node will or or system will uh, a function that the system will call in response to an event. Right, the event here is that a parameter, one or more parameters, is being changed. Right, so that's what callback means. Parameters, okay. Well, we're focused on parameters. Set, we're setting these parameters. Right, pre here. This is the time 
or the relative time in this process of when these parameters get uh, changed. So we're gonna have a pre, on, and post. Okay? And then this add is just meaning that uh, as a programmer, you're, you're gonna write a callback routine. And you, you can call that routine anything, right? You can call it, um, you know, check for valid parameters on change or um, uh, function one, <laughs> whatever, right? So you can call it anything you want. You're going to register it with the system by adding it in this uh, uh, call here, right? So this is going to be a call that you're going to make, and uh, you're going to... Uh, there's going to be some signature, a calling signature associated with this that's going to include your function name. Then when, uh, so that function name should be prepared to accept a mutable list of parameter objects that are being changed, right? So the framework's going to gather up uh, one or more parameter objects that are being changed. Maybe there are several being changed at once, and it's... Uh, uh, if there's a callback that's been registered, it's going to call it, and it's going to provide it this list of um, parameter objects. Now, note that it's mutable, and so if you can't accept a change uh, in that, then you can uh, drop it out of the list, right? Um, so that's your one and only chance to do that. Then these others are going to be immutables right so uh and you'll get one that's on uh as it's being uh, uh then being changed and then post right so maybe you need to um uh, respond to this on and uh make the change and then maybe uh afterwards uh after they've all been changed then now you need to go back and maybe update some algorithms or, or something like that, right? So uh, three different callbacks associated with the parameters there. All right, so that's kind of the, 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 the different pieces of the ROS uh, architecture system. And, uh, but then now we have this uh, client libraries. So RCL is the C language application programming interface API that implements this basic functionality, right? And then there's uh, maybe official and also community support of wrappers on top of C, right? So C is that nice common denominator, right? And um, C is, is very close to kind of the assembly machine level so that uh, you know you can do almost anything in C, right? It's not going to be restricted, and uh, so it's uh, that uh, basic functionality being implemented in C. And now, uh, but you know, a lot of us don't program in C um, much um, if we can avoid it. <laughs> and so uh, maybe you're developing C plus plus or Python then uh, you're going to have a wrapper binding on that. So you can totally work in Python, but then these wrappers then translate uh, all your calls and interactions with this client library into the C calls. And C is where it works. Done. So these are very lightweight wrappers. And uh, this community support, so the official support means that it's done by the Ross organization, right? So when they... Uh, release a new uh, version of, of ROS, they make sure that these uh, RCL CPPs and RCL PYs are up to date, right? And they're maintained. But uh, there's lots of languages out there these days, right? And uh, Rust and uh, is, is gaining in, in popularity. It's a pretty cool language. Uh, Node.js, .node Core. Uh, so you, if you're doing C sharp or something like that, you probably uh, you know implementing it through .NET Core, uh, Java virtual machines, Androids, Androids uh, you know basically a Java uh, centric type language. Um, so uh, or operating system that's Java centric, I should say. Um, all right, so that's uh, that's client libraries, and then 
we have uh, ROS workspaces. Now, a workspace technically is a structured directory tree, and you're going to have a, a source, build, install, log. Now, you might create the source yourself and create some source files there or do a git clone and download it from uh, some uh, source code repository. And then you might use this Colcon uh, tool to actually build out the workspaces. And uh, so it'll, it'll take care of building that code and installing it and maintaining logs of all this process also. So this is the tool which you would use to, um, to kind of work in these things, right? So, uh, and this workspace is going to expect to have these kind of peer directories here. And then uh, kind of hand wavy here, but um, uh, you're going to have this idea of underlay and overlays. Uh, so what, and what that means is that like this underlay is kind of the, the foundation of things. And you'll see as we switch over and look at uh, some examples here that we um, kind of initialize an environment. If you remember in our super quick, super high level Python uh, uh, primer, we uh, talked about virtual environments a little bit. And uh, there you create a virtual environment and then you source it to activate it uh, in, in Linux or you run a script in Windows or whatever. But uh, so similar type of concept, you're, you're sourcing this setup in this uh, installation, so opt, in Linux is kind of your um, kind of programs directory for uh, kind of bigger programs that uh, are uh, user added, right? So that's uh, maybe not very uh, accurate or precise, but uh, it's a common location to install things. Uh, ROS is the ROS, right? Iron is a release of ROS too in this case, and then um, your your sourcing this setup.bash, right? And then that provides you kind of that foundation that you're dealing with that, that you're going to work at as, as an overlay. So everything you do is then going to be running on top of this underlay foundation. So you can kind of build up overlays and there's a, a hierarchical relationship with things. Right, a little bit like inheritance, but not. So, um, but uh, the overlay is typically where you write your application code. All right, so then we have uh, kind of this. You know, a lot of times when you learn a new program or or something like that, a new new programming language or framework, you'll deal with a hello world example, and. So maybe the Ross Talker listener is equivalent to the Hello World. So the talker is publishing messages on a topic, right? So here's our, our little bit of a directed graph, right? So our node is publishing onto a topic. It's a directed thing. And then um, this subscriber is uh, listening to those messages. But it doesn't have to be just one subscriber. It can be uh, a bunch of them. Right. So, um, all right. So let's let's get our hands dirty here a little bit. I'm going to switch over to my uh, Linux box, and we're going to play with this a little bit. Um, let's see if. Okay. Um, all right, so I've got a, um, a bunch of terminal windows running here on my Ubuntu uh, 22 distribution. I've installed ROS, and you'll see up here that I have sourced this uh, setup configuration. Let's uh, actually uh, look at that real quick. So... So here, this is just kind of a, a shell script type format. It's uh, uh, telling you what uh, shell to use, a bash shell, uh, and that this is how things are interpreted in a terminal window. 
um, and uh, sets up some directory paths and, and whatnot, right? So, and then ultimately calls these other uh, setup uh, routines. So, uh, so we, we source that and that, that's as uh, fancy as it gets. But now we're going to run a uh, talker. But actually, before we do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna run a listener down here, and uh, just to kind of show you what happens. Uh, not a lot because there's no talker, right? But it's it's not crashing, right? So right now there's one listener and zero talkers or or publishers, right? So let's uh, let's start a talker. And oh, there we go. Hello world zero one two zero one two three four. So now you see these two are communicating. Well, let's run another one. And oh, we picked up at twelve, right? So we just picked up right where they're at. And there's not a, a memory or persistence on these things, um, but they're uh, they're just in a queue. But both of these are listening to them at the same time if i stop this guy then these listeners have stopped but they're uh they're not crashing right and if i start this guy up again there they go right now he starts at zero and so that's the data that we're seeing and i can drop this guy out and everything keeps running i can start him again and uh it's, it's picking up the values right where they are at. So that's a uh, classic uh, pub sub type architecture. And now uh, we're, we have this uh, topic and uh, the messages are in this topic are a, a string and a integer value, right? Or this whole thing could, you know, it's, it's, we I'm interpreting this as an integer value, but that whole thing is one one message um, uh, as as a string, right? So uh, this is a date uh, timestamp over here of some sort, I guess. So I don't know how to interpret that, but that's what it looks like. So um, now on this, you could have other type of topics, and they can all be on the same bus. Uh, in the same queue, all uh, happily cohabitating with each other, but uh, you know you're going to subscribe to a particular topic, and you're going to publish to a particular topic. But I could have a different uh, publisher publishing other things, uh, and maybe another window and other subscriber units and that type of thing. So. Um, Well, there's something else I was going to say about that, but now I, I, uh, it just escaped my mind. So, um, okay, so that's um, that's essentially pub and sub type of uh, type of work there, right? So, let's also look at uh, kind of a another type of interaction showing this kind of control uh, type situation. I've got two tabs open in this uh, terminal window. In this first one, I'm running what's called Turtle Sim, which comes with the ROS system. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, So um, it's just kind of a handy thing to play with and, and try things out with and, and experiment, right? So uh, I've run this uh, turtle sim. Oh, well, we can look up here. Um, so once you've sourced this, uh, then ROS2 command becomes available. All right, so let's let's double check that. If I just type in ROS2 without doing a source, it doesn't find it. All right, so uh, but if we 
do the sorts, it sets our pass up so that now ROS2 is a command in the path of, uh, of the shell running here. And then it's going to take uh, arguments, right? Or, you know, this uh, package is kind of a subcommand, right? So, or, or, or maybe better said, ROS2 is the uh, program, and then this is the command that we're asking the program to do. And it's going to interact with the packages. In particular, it's going to list the executables in this TurtleSim package. Right, and uh, so we've got uh, in Turtle Sim, we've got draw square, we've got mimic, we've got turtle tell op key, and Turtle Sim node. So we're going to first run Turtle Sim node. Uh, maybe I'll cancel it first, and we'll we'll start from scratch here. So it uh, prints out some information. It's got a um, uh, a background here that is blue that's configurable through parameters right we can change that uh, background color and then this is some sort of crazy rocket propelled turtle and uh, it's placed in a default location and uh, we've got one uh, running here now uh, it's not doing anything right so I just press some arrow keys nothing's happening what we've got here is uh, uh, now we're going to run this turtle sim, uh, turtle teleop key. And now here, this is now going to turn into my control, right? So I can hit the up arrow and it's gonna go for a little while and then it's gonna stop, right? So uh, I just tapped it and it went a certain distance and stopped. You think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? So you don't, um, if you have this kind of uh, loosely coupled controller and actuator, uh, it's a robot, and uh, you told it to start going forward, but then you lost connection, and it still goes forward and plows over uh, all sorts of things that would be bad, right? So. Uh, it's in this case, it's just the way this particular implementation has been designed. It's going to go for a little bit and then stop if uh, that key is no longer pressed. Right? So I can turn it around a little bit. I just press the left arrow and I can press again. I press a, a back arrow, down arrow, and uh, that type of thing. So, uh, so the you know the point isn't. You know, controlling a robot. The point is that here we have two different programs running, and they are communicating. And this is uh, representing an environment and a controller. I think I can run another one here. So let's see. Uh, I did a little bit of this before. Let's see if I can figure out what I uh, how I did that off the top of my head <laughs> okay so now uh ross2 run turtle sim and that was called uh turtle sim turtle tell up key yeah and uh so now i've got this guy and so now i'm controlling it from there so now we could have two different control stations, right? And uh, two different um, abilities to control this. You can think of this in a couple of ways. You might have a pilot and co-pilot, right? Or you um, might want a, like a, a commander override or something like that. Or you might implement one of these as manual control algorithm and another one that maybe an autonomy package or a scripted type package um, that maybe would just move it in a dead reckoning uh, standpoint, not really using much uh, AI or autonomy, but um, the different ways of controlling that robot. So the key here is that these are loosely coupled 
type of uh, uh, systems. All right, so lots more to play with the ROS. Uh, if you're one of those uh, people that wants to uh, really needs another assignment to work on. Uh, I can um, give you some work to do with Ross, but I think it's good to have a, a pretty good, you know, at least an introduction to that. Um, I wish we had a, a chance to do labs. If I could be confident that we could all install these things on, you know, Linux box and, and play with them, then um, uh, we, could, we could do kind of a remote lab, but um, not, not uh, super trivial there. So uh, let me go ahead and share, go back to my other computer and let's finish up. So um, okay, so that was Ross and uh, there's, uh, you know, ROS is huge in terms of scope. It's used by many different uh, people, organizations at many different levels, uh, different target type robots, lots of different kinds of, of robots, and um, even like space-based ones and whatnot. Um, and also from everywhere from research to actually just operational type of things, right? But they're not the, it's not the only one. And there's certainly going to be some proprietary ones out there, right? But uh, another one that is is worth looking at um, is this Moose IVP. And hang on a second. I just want to make sure that everything's running here. Okay. So Moose uh, IVP Home is uh, kind of partially developed at MIT and partially developed at Oxford. And there's a few other uh, universities that have uh, some collaboration, but at a lesser level. Uh, I've worked with this. And also, one of the uh, prime contractors on the Army robotic combat vehicles uses Moose, uh, the Moose system and the army in their version of the army rcv so um but it's really kind of originally geared towards autonomous marine vessels uh, i used it on a submersible uh um uh, autonomous vessel uh, but again it can uh, apply to others and again here's a uh, a link to that and i will uh let's see so uh it's Again, an open source type thing. It's uh, ultimately specified and in, in, uh, or implemented in C++ modules, um, but it, it's a loosely coupled system also, right? So um, uh, Moose itself stands for Mission Oriented Operating Suite. It's an autonomy middleware. The IVP is, uh, stands for interval programming. Uh, it's kind of a mashup of a couple of mathematical terms, including dynamic programming and, and all. But uh, it's, you can think of it as, as solving for multi-objective optimization, right? So you can imagine that a robot or an autonomous vessel or vehicle or something like that might have more than one objective that it has, right? It's got objective to keep keep uh, passengers or freight or itself safe. Uh, it's going to have a mission to do, to move somewhere, maybe do something when it gets there. Um, there, there might be, you know, it might uh, need to stay covert in a military aspect, or it may want to stay um, uh, very visible if it's uh, navigating in a uh, congested harbor or something like that, right? So, uh, you know, the point being is that there can be multiple different objectives. The IVP is designed to try to optimize those uh, concurrently, right? So multi-objective 
optimization with some some waiting there. And then Helm is the actual uh, autonomy package, and these terms are a little bit squishy here. Um, it's, okay, uh, just a few more slides here, and uh, but you can. Think of this as kind of a backseat driver design philosophy. So you've got this Moose system up here with the IVP Helm doing this autonomous decision making as a process, right? And then it communicates with Moose. There's a Moose DB where uh, all the, well, uh, maybe my next slide shows that. I'm not sure. Um, so, but this is like, like the captain of the ship uh, that's making the decisions on where the ship should go and uh, like how fast that they should get there and that type of thing. But, you know, typically on big ships, the captain's not the actual one sitting at the helm or the throttle, right? You've got some seaman doing that, some sailor. And so, uh, or if you like, watch Star Trek or something like that, right? So you'd have the, the captain and he would give the order, but then you would have a helmsman that would actually punch it in and, and make it go, right? So that's, they call that the backseat driver design philosophy. So you've got kind of a lower level uh, main vehicle computer. And we've seen this a little bit in that kind of, um, you know, maybe about uh, three weeks ago or something where we were uh, three and four weeks ago where we we're looking at how um, after we do that basic perception and localization, then we kind of go through these hierarchy of behavioral decisions and all the way down to the control system, right? So uh, this is kind of following that same thing. This guy's uh, up here is making those high level decisions. Um, but then down here, you've got the uh, control logic to actually make it so. Okay. Um, all right. Then, uh, oops, wrong way. Uh, so I mentioned Moose DB. So you have, again, kind of a loosely coupled uh, situation of Moose applications, and it's uh, uh, publishing and subscribing data back and forth, but then it all goes through this Moose DB. And now you can have persistence in this Moose DB and uh, like this um, uh, company I worked with would, would collect data and then they'd be able to play it back using Moose DB and play it back as if it's being done in real time, uh, but just arbitrarily uh, later. And uh, so everything is connected in through this Moose DB, including this IDG Helm autonomy package. So then the last thing to talk about this Moose uh, IVP Helm is uh, the idea that it's basically built on these um, uh, behaviors. And uh, so we have, uh, you, you can declare different behaviors and uh, different modes of the mission, right? And uh, so you can piece together very complex missions and kind of pre-program them, right? So you might want to uh, have a underwater submersible kind of uh, navigate out away from its mothership, maybe dive to a certain depth, maybe navigate some more, and then locate um, some feature underwater autonomously, maybe do some work, maybe it's uh, doing some underwater welding on a drilling platform uh, type of thing down there, uh, down at the seafloor bed or somewhere in between, right? So it has to have some autonomy to be able to lo localize that, do the work, and then uh, return, right? So um, as that mission is going on, it's it's going through different modes of operation, right? So it can switch through that. And it, it, it's got it as a little uh, tree graph right there, right? And so it can activate different behaviors uh, during these times, right? So as a developer, you're kind of declaring mission modes and how you switch from one mission mode to another. 
and then you're also uh, developing these behaviors. Now, uh, you can imagine that with the, you know certain size ecosystems, a lot of these behaviors are in common and already written. It's open source systems, so um, you, you might just need to write a few of these to uh, actually implement your system, right? So, uh, so here we've got three different behaviors activated in this particular mission mode right now. And then this IVP solver, that's all part of this IVP helm here, is now looking at these behaviors and trying to come up with a decision that best satisfies all of these guys in the optimal uh, uh, semantics, right? And so it's it's outputting that decision. And it might be to, um, uh, you know, go uh, at a certain rate, at a certain heading, at a certain angle to uh, either go deeper or, or rise up or something like that, right? And then uh, there'll be another um, connection to the Moose uh, database here that would go to this vehicle navigation control system that would decide, okay, how do I pivot my asympods or uh, fins or, and how fast do I run a particular thruster? Uh, again, just talking about a, a submersible here. And uh, do, I, do I need to change my buoyancy or anything like that, right? And uh, to actually decide what kind of voltages or pulse width modulation to actually send to the motor drive controllers uh, to actually make all that happen. So that's Moose IVP uh, Helm and just uh, yet another uh, example of a, um, uh, an autonomy-based package. So ROS itself is not necessarily autonomous, as I uh, was mentioning earlier. Uh, you can certainly uh, attach a node that is implementing autonomy. Right, uh, but you're going to have to do that. Uh, whereas the Moose system, the the Moose part is uh, very loosely equivalent to Ross, in that it's providing that kind of idea of, of nodes and communications, pub sub type uh, communications between them. It's the IVP Helm that is really developed for a uh, autonomy package right and so uh you could certainly have build the equivalent and attach that to a raw system as another node that would then um, uh, subscribe to all these things and that type of thing it's just that with this uh ross uh, i mean this moose ivp system with these mission modes and these behaviors um and then that uh that multi-objective uh, optimization solver, uh, the IVP solver, that um, that's a whole framework in and of itself to do that autonomy. So, okay, so that's it. Um, I'll uh, check the poll one last time. And um, all right, we're still at 11 votes, so no one else voted. Um, and um, so I guess that's all we have on here right now, right? Four, six, ten. Actually, we got we have ten people and eleven votes. Uh, someone someone must have dropped off. And so, um, um, yeah, if you're one of those three and you really need some extra work, um, uh, talk to me about it. You may not really need it. Uh, to get the grade you want, uh, but let's let's see. We can have a conversation, but uh, I don't think we'll add any more assignments. We did have those five assignments. Some were hard, some were easy, but you know they were at the beginning of the semester. Now let's totally focus on the project and the uh, research reviews. And uh, so we we had another set due, and so I'll. Uh, kind of continue to give you feedback, but I think we're all on the right track there. Okay. All right. 
Well, uh, that'll be it. We finished a couple, of, a few minutes early this week. Thank you, Dr. Hara. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Take care. Thank Have you. a good week.